In this video, we'll begin our calculation of the first order correction to the energy due to the Zeeman effect in the weak field uh, approximation. And in the last video, what we found was that our Zeeman Hamiltonian was already diagonalized in the coupled basis. So in the basis where we specify the state of a system by the principal quantum number, the orbital angular momentum, the total angular momentum, and the Z projection of the total angular momentum. What this means then is we can use our result from the degenerate perturbation theory to calculate the first order correction, even though our spectrum continues to be degenerate. And this is again, because of our loophole in the degenerate perturbation theory that says if we can find a basis in which this is already diagonalized, then non-degenerate perturbation theory converges to the same result. What this means mathematically then is we only need to calculate the diagonal elements of the Seaman Hamiltonian in this basis. So if we plug in our value for the Zeeman Hamiltonian, and this is, we'll call the correction uh, WF Zeeman for weak field Zeeman. And this will have the constants from up here. the operator for the Z component of the orbital angular momentum plus two times the Z component of the spin. And we can break this up into two terms because we're uh, summing two operators. The first one over here is fairly simple because uh, we can re-express this LZ plus two S N as the total, the operator for the uh, Z component of the total angular momentum plus one, uh, operator for the set component of the spin angular momentum. And this is just because this is equal to L set plus S set. So rewriting this, we end up with the following expression. This over here is a two, that's an operator. And this is this first one applying this one to this cat is fairly easy because this is an eigenstate of the set component of the total length of momentum because one of the uh, quantum numbers is mj. So what we get from this first operator is just an h bar mj. And this is, this is coming from the fact that uh, this is any state that uh, specifies the uh, set component of the total angular momentum is an eigenstate. This is J, it's an eigenstate with eigenvalue H bar and J. And we still have the term due to the spin over here.
we're going to call this the expectation value of SN because that's an equivalent terminology. This is expectation value of the Z component of the spin. And this is just from a definition of expectation value that it's, uh, it's calculated as this matrix element. The problem now is that we don't have a good way of calculating this at the moment because this is not an eigenstate of a Z. If you recall, the whole reason we had to build up this set of states is because in the presence of spin orbit coupling, uh, the is that component of the spin is no longer conserved. So there's no simple, uh, at the moment, no simple way of finding the expectation value of this operator. However, it turns out that uh, we can re-express the expectation value of SZ by the following, using the following identity have the, the commutator between the total magnitude, the magnitude of the total angular momentum with the operator of J squared and each component of the spin. This is proportional to the following expression. I won't prove the result here. I will just have to take it at face value. Here, the S vector is just denoting uh, all of the components of the spin. And uh, by extension, this J vector is also specifying all of the components of the total angular momentum. So instead of calculating the expectation value for SZ, we're going to calculate the expectation value of this expression. Okay, so that expectation value just means putting this operator in between these brackets. Um, for simplicity, because N and L are not changing, I'm just going to replace this by, uh, I'm just going to start writing J, M, J, because those are uh, the quantities that are of interest here and N and L will remain constant. They won't play a role anymore. Okay, so expanding this out, this is what our first commutator gives us. And because these are eigenstates of the J squared operator and its remission, J squared operating on an eigenstate of the operator just gives us uh, an eigenvalue equation. And because this is remission, it can also act on the bra JMJ, and it will also give us uh, an eigenvalue equation. So this first one would be h squared 
uh, j times j plus one. So this is from this first operator. And the second one, applying j squared to this, again, gives us the same eigenvalue because this is just a number. We can take it out of the brackets and we're left with the same expression subtracting itself. So this is actually equal to zero. And maybe to write it out, this is just because we can factor out this constant. So this is from our first term over here. And this is from our second term over here. And you see that these two expressions are the same and you're subtracting them from one another. So that's why you end up with a zero here. Now, we also said that there was an identity which said that this commutator was proportional to this quantity. So now we're going to calculate the expectation value of this term over here. And we know it has to give us zero because the expectation value of this quantity was zero. And again, I'm only going to specify J and MJ. Uh, the other quantum numbers N and L are constants. So we don't need to keep writing them out because it's redundant. Okay, so this is from our first term over here, minus one half J and J. All right, so we've already calculated the expectation value of this side, we got zero. Now we're going to calculate the expectation value of this side over here. And that's what this expression is over here. All right, so we know that this has to equal to zero because the expectation value of this was equal to zero. So we can bring one term over to the other side. Now we can play the same trick with this term over here. This j square, because it's Hermitian, can act on the bra and give us an eigenvalue equation. And this j square can act on this cat and again give us an eigenvalue expression. So we have the same situation that we had over here, where we end up with an h bar j times j plus one. And because it's just a number, we can factor it out and we pick up an extra factor of two. And we have h squared k times j plus one. Okay. Again, this is from applying a j squared over here. We pick up one h bar squared j times j plus one. And this operator acting on the ket, we get another h bar squared j times j plus one. Adding them together, uh, because you have a constant factor, you pick up a factor of two, which cancels out this one half. And what we get then is this term over here, we can rewrite as the expectation value 
of this operator. This is equal to this h bar squared j times j plus one. Uh, this is just the expectation value of j squared. And uh, we have the expectation value of s from this term over here. So just to make this clear, this is the same thing This is how we calculate expectation values, and this was just h bar squared j squared plus one, because these are eigenstates of this operator. In other words, we have that the expectation value of the spin operator is equal to the expectation value of this complicated looking expression over the expectation value of j squared. And this result is known as the projection lemma. The reason it's called the projection lemma is because this quantity over here gives you the projection of the spin vector along the total angular momentum. So if you have uh, some vector B and a vector A, the uh, component of A along B, or equivalently the projection of A onto B, is given. So this is the projection and because B is not normalized, you have to divide by the magnitude of B. So this is the component of A along B. Likewise, this expression over here gives you the component of the spin along the total angular momentum. And that's the expectation value that we're interested in calculating. So using this expression, remember the whole point was um, was this over here. We were, uh, we were looking to calculate what this quantity was in our first order correction. Okay, so in the next video, we'll put everything together. We use this projection lemma along with our expression for the first order correction of the Zeeman effect to get a final expression uh, in terms of known quantities for the Zeeman effect.